right into it. All righty, good evening, everyone. I'm Christina M. Johnson of Testimony Publishers, LLC, Entrepreneurs Who Rise and Self Publishers Hub. And I am welcoming you to this live event tonight. As you can see, I have a guest with me tonight that I am so excited to introduce to you all. So say hello, let's make sure we can hear you well. Um, Dr. Uzziah Harris, are you there? I'm there. How's everybody doing? Good evening. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So we can hear you loud and clear. Everything's um, clear. We can see you. Um, so, um, and we even have a few people that are already joining us. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on in. I want you all to share this out because we need as many people to see this live stream or to see the replay of this live stream, because what we are going to be talking about this evening, it concerns our families, it concerns our communities, our churches. So this is gonna uh, be a, a conversation that you do not want to miss. So please share this out. Um, if you are on live, give me a hashtag live so that we can acknowledge you. Um, if you're watching the replay, go ahead, hashtag replay so that we can um, jump on in and just say hi and thank you for watching the replay. All right, so as you all know, um, some of you may know um, Testimony Publishers LLC is a publishing company. We help people share their stories, um, their expertise and their experiences through the written word. So whether it's in an ebook, a print book, or on stage, we actually help you to be able to hone your skills and share. Um, to your community, to your family, and build a lasting legacy. Um, Dr. Uzziah is here with us. He is our author spotlight, um, our highlight and feature for the evening. I wanna introduce you before we even get into what we're gonna be talking about. We have a lot to talk about, your book, um, things you're doing in the community, upcoming events. So I wanna read a little bit of your bio so I can, you know, I may not do it justice, but I wanna at least give <laughs> a shot. <laughs> All Thank right, you. <laughs> Here it goes. Alrighty, so Dr. Uzziah Harris, the very name embodies strength because it, Uzziah means strength of God. Um, he has been tirelessly investing in the lives of people um, and communities for, for decades. Um, he has left a lasting legacy already for himself and his family um, through culture, human rights, civil rights. He's been on a journey as a dedicated middle school teacher, starting out in Richmond, Virginia, um, during the late 1990s, where he, was, he first discovered his passion for empowering others. Throughout his distinguished career, um, Dr. Uzziah has worn many hats, excelling as a qualified mental health professional, recreation center supervisor, human services program administrator, and even as a Richmond City Council aide. His commitment to community engagement has been the driving force behind his endeavors, rooted in the profound belief that we are all interconnected. For him, the mission to guide those lost back to their true selves and past is an innate calling that shapes his very existence. Dr. Harris is a multi-talented individual also holding the titles of a certified life coach, ordained minister, um, he also has been ordained by the esteemed Association of Evangelical Gospel Assemblies. Um, he, uh, he's also a scholar with a profound thirst for knowledge. He obtained his undergraduate degrees in psychology and education from uh, the College of William and Mary in 1999. Uh, and he also sought um, educational opportunities after that um, with the university's uh, Virginia Union University School of Theology. In 2012 and 2014, Dr. Harris earned both his Master of Divinity, let me get this right, and Doctor of Divinity degrees, respectively, from Virginia Triumphant College and Seminary, um, a testament to his dedication and scholarly pursuit of a deeper understanding of faith. Um, he is also a pastor. Um, he's a teacher. So I can go on for probably over an hour, but I'm going to stop and let Dr. Harris, Dr. Uzziah Anthony Harris, just say a little bit and talk a little bit about you um, and how it feels to have done all of these things um, throughout your lifetime thus far. You know, I, I think that um, the scary thing is uh, many times when I look back at it and I look at what I'm doing, um, 
I can only give glory to God first and foremost, because I know who I am. Uh, I know my multitudinous shortcomings, right? Uh, as we all do, we all fall short. And I know if left to my own devices, um, half the things God has allowed me to accomplish, surely there isn't any way in the world that, that I would have accomplished it. Many times uh, I'm sitting back and I'm thinking, hey, I'm just living my life. I'm not doing anything extraordinary. Uh, I'm not doing anything that is abnormal. Uh, I'm not in any way an anomaly. Uh, I'm, I'm really an underachiever and, and I have a little bit of time left to do a whole lot more. And so I find myself having to calm myself uh, and be much more grateful. And I think as I've gotten older, I've become much more grateful. Hey, uh, we need to stop looking in other people's lanes and, and we need to be thankful for the lane God put us in. And we need to maximize our own opportunities and we need to be content, not complacent. Those are two different things. We need to be content with what God is doing uh, based on what we gave God to work with. So when I look at what I gave God to work with, uh, Sister Christina, I know I didn't give him a whole lot. Uh, I probably should be giving him a whole lot more. God has done amazing things with this little life. And I just pray uh, while I have a little more vigor, and while I have a little more time, that I am living in such a way that I'm maximizing what God is giving me and that I'm living in a way that he's pleased. Amen, amen to that. I think um, to a certain extent, many of us feel that way, um, that we just may not be given enough. You know, but sometimes, you know, I think God looks down on, on people like you and, and others and says, that definitely glorified me, son, or that definitely glorified me, daughter you know, thank you, thank you, and, and it is pleased. So the work you've done in, in your family and your community is, is definitely commendable. Um, in reference to your book, uh, many of us, we can see it, hopefully everyone watching can see um, your, your book in the background, Trial by Fire, just the title alone is intriguing. You know, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I'm gonna get into um, some questions about some of the things that you're doing in the community now. Um, and, and what God has you doing um, on Sundays and, and all of that. But in, in Trial by Fire, some people have called it um, a catalyst for self-reflection. Mm. Um, after reading it, they have been able to kind of look at some of the things that they do or say or even think um, and, and try and change those things or purpose to change those things. Share a little bit about some of the principles in Trial by Fire, Deliberations Over the Soul of America, um, that our, your readers and our viewers can take away and maybe implement in their lives. Right, right. So, uh, you know, it's very in interesting, the providence of God. I remember uh, as it was coming together, I didn't know it was going to be what it currently is. And, and even now, you know, God whispers in, in, in my ear, you know, eyes haven't seen nor, nor ears heard. I, I'm just scratching the surface. I think it's one thing. Uh, and God is showing me every day that he's doing something entirely different. We're coming off the heels of what seemed to be 2016, 2017, uh, the resurgence of um, very overt, open uh, police brutality, uh, where we are beginning to see uh, the disintegration of civility as it relates to American politics and just civil discourse in general. Uh, you, you see uh, a group of people who now look at uh, 2000 plus, if you will, and say, this doesn't look uh, much different from 1950, whatever, uh, and are becoming more vocal about uh, our history, uh, more vocal about our present and wanting to have much more determination and autonomy over our future. And so I actually started it as a series of uh, just writings, if you will. Some were essays, uh, some were uh, quasi journal entries, uh, some were just you know a brief thought uh, after watching the news or uh, being exposed to yet another uh, bit of disappointment uh, on social media or what have you. And it became this uh, sort of allegory, this uh, sort of uh, fictional yet non-fictional work with, with his history attached to it and, and, and social critical commentary attached to it uh, that I believe offers uh, at least 
some people the opportunity both to see their voice and others to hear voices not traditionally heard uh, and be able to decide you know where we want to go from there there are so many different themes in in this particular book trial by fire um, when you talk about uh, biblical reaping and sowing and maybe people don't know about biblical reaping and sowing so i'll secularize it and say accounting and accountability at some point we have to pay uh the piper and i believe that 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 time is near uh the the theme of truth never being hidden or held hostage for long because i don't think that the truth is hidden i think we've held it hostage i think we've tried to manipulate it I think that it has been whitewashed. I think that it has been uh, flooded and surrounded, maybe even an attempted to be canceled out uh, with a series of lies. But truth never, ever, ever stays hidden. It outlasts uh, even the most vicious lie. Mm -hmm. And we're at a place in time in our history where I believe truth will stand for itself and we will be forced to choose a side. Uh, and, and based on what our choices are, I believe will determine the fate of our nation. Um, there's a spirit of diversity in the book. So if, if you're familiar with the book, you haven't read it, please go take a read, right? Um, you get a series of voices uh, who are on the jury. This is a, a jury of peers, um, African-Americans who are judging uh, the crimes uh, of America. These crimes are laid out, articulated, uh, with with history laid out uh, with a certain meticulousness. This is not just some sort of uh, intense visceral feeling. No, these are the charges codified in black and white and America must answer to those. Yet in that, when you look at the jury, like any other jury, even though all of these persons are persons uh, of African descent or descendants of the enslaved, there are many different voices in the room. And I think that's important. And these voices come into conflict with each other, right? Because many people think that black people are a monolith. No, black people are no more a monolith than white people or pink people or polka dot people or any other people. You get two people in the room, they can be in the same house, grow up with the same mother and father, and you're gonna have different perspectives. And so you see the clash of these perspectives and you get to see a full picture, uh, the full gamut of emotions uh, and sentiment as it relates to uh, African-American people who are here in the United States of America. And you get to ride with that. You, you, you get to ride on that journey with the ebbs and flows. You get to decide where you fall. You get to agree or disagree, but it's all food for thought once again, um, because I believe if we don't begin to look at ourselves more critically with the intention of wanting to do something about it. My grandfather dealt with racism. My daddy, dealt with racism. I grew up with, with racism. Why are our children still growing up with the same thing? Uh, at some point, we need to put it to bed and realize if we don't, uh, our own nation is in trouble. So the last thing there is that we have a voice, right? Uh, we have a voice and that our voice becomes the ultimate determinant in the destiny of our nation. Wow. Um, what's so fascinating to me um, is the the analogy that the story is 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 written in um, or allegory because it is an actual trial like you are putting America on trial and I was just thinking of like law and order in the back of my head you know and it was just like okay you got down to the bottom of it you have evidence you have people's um, witnesses you have um, Opinions being stated, facts being stated, and truths um, that are are realized um, by the the end of the book. But for the reader, though, the reader still has to make a decision. And I thought that was that was um, just a really intriguing um, place to kind of leave the reader to actually make a decision: Are you going to move forward with this truth, make a change, or you know, are you going to be complacent, like you just mentioned, and stay the same? Um, as a life coach, um, I want you to think about what you wrote in the book and mm -hmm. how some of those truths and, and the evidences that had been presented, how does that affect 
the lives of the very people that have to still kind of live with the actual effects of it and even residual effects of some of the things that have occurred in, in the United States of America concerning um, its citizens of uh, African slaves. Yeah, I, I think part of the biggest uh, misconception is that when you think about the historicity of slavery uh, and the aftermath of it, because you know most people, well, there are some people who wanna relegate the suffering of certain persons to just that. And then they wanna be able to say, well, slavery ended uh, a long time ago. And so everything should be fine now. And what we fail to consider uh, are the after effects, uh, both in law uh, and in practice uh, that continue to persist, right? Uh, you look at your current prison system now uh, and it finds its beginnings uh, in peonage, which directly is an offshoot uh, of slavery. What we, what we try to conjecture and feel like is that it's a black problem, that their trauma is their, their trauma. What, what America doesn't really give enough credence to is that all persons were traumatized by this particular experience. When you talk about the desensitizing of one group of people because they had to justify uh, a barbaric wrong. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the hidden shame of some persons, right? Because this is not who I am and I can't help that my ancestors were this way, right? That, that's a lot of your discussion as it relates uh, to education and those circles around what some people characterize as CRT or critical race theory, right? Uh, it's a big misnomer, right? Because everybody knows that there's no such thing as critical race theory in elementary, middle or high schools. Uh, it's become really the umbrella of, I don't wanna talk about quote unquote, the tough stuff because we're going to be uncomfortable. So part of the job of the life coach is understanding trauma uh, and, and not being willing to open wounds and not leave them open at the end of the session. So that's mm -hmm. part of it, right? Understanding that when I started on this journey, uh, my job isn't to simply be uh, some type of prognosticator. Uh, the, this is where we're headed because of where we've been uh, or simply be what many people are uh, a diagnostician. This is the problem. Everybody knows the problem. Uh, we have to get to the place where we're talking about solutions. And what is interesting about life coaching is uh, my job as a life coach is never to give solutions, but to help folks find solutions, right? And we're talking about the paradigms, the thought process that create habits, that create cyclical behavior, that create recurring issues in person's lives. The life coach has to help that person deconstruct their thinking, those paradigms, to, to hopefully change behavior, and then as a consequence, be able to have a different result. So uh, as it relates to anyone's life goals, uh, career goals, particularly relationships. And when you talk about racism in America, you're talking about relationship. A nation decided uh, that they would not have relationship with a certain group of people unless they were deemed subhuman. And that type of behavior has had long lasting effects even today, right? And you can go back just, uh, you don't have to go back far. You go back to maybe 2018-ish, right? Uh, under the former presidency. And we, we as a nation were literally putting children in cages uh, setting them before judges, and they didn't even speak the language. They didn't have an advocate. Some of them were lost in the foster system. And, and we did no more than a shoulder shrug because we are desensitized, uh, because we have a history uh, of dehumanizing those we don't consider us, pun intended, U.S., right? And so uh, my job as a life coach, hopefully, uh, is to look at that trauma, is to, to dig into that trauma with the client, helping them to pull out, uh, again, those very deep-seated uh, thought patterns and behaviors and try to disrupt those things to get a much different outcome. Right, right. When, when you think about, um, and, and you touched on uh, being a life coach and, and what that means for um, the person that you're actually helping, but what if someone is unable to say, get to you, 
you know, and, and hire you as a life coach? What are some things that they may be able to do, um, you know, at home or um, in their thought processes or, or implement in their lives um, where they can kind of get a, a feel good win um, that, mm. okay, this is where I am um, and this is a start, something that they can do and, and kind of motivate or encourage them or empower them to, to move forward and continue in the process of healing. Yeah, I, I think uh, education is extremely important. I think that uh, at least in, 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 in communities of color for a long period of time, what we have known, and maybe if this was a product, uh, a byproduct of segregation, we knew uh, if we were going to be educated and socialized, that that education and socialization had to take place outside the mainstream context. That the books that you were reading could not be the be all and end all of information. Uh, that, that the uh, educators who were dispensing the information, uh, whether well-intentioned or not, could not be the end all and be all uh, of education. So what we had to do was go outside of those, those realms and seek and search for the truth. I think it starts with education and truth. And with that comes the inventory, right? Because once I've become educated about a thing, then I can take inventory. Uh, this is what I'm pleased with. This, this is the direction that I'm happy with. These are some things I wish uh, could change. And once you decide on those things, then it's easier to decide, okay, what needs to be done? What steps should I take with this particular situation that I am unhappy with, that I wanna see a change in? Excellent, excellent. Um, that, it works. That works for so many people because it's easy. You, you can you know, reflect and then you can decide to say, okay, I'm going to give it a, a shot. I'm going to make a concerted effort to do this. Mm -hmm. Now that's kind of related to the person, the individual. What about churches? What, what would you say trial by fire kind of um, presents to churches within our communities in reference to acknowledging the issue and, and um, implementing change or being a catalyst for change? Yeah, I think that, uh, and, and you know, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Uh, I pastor a church. I'm proud to pastor a church uh, here in my locality of Culpeper, Virginia. Uh, I've been pastor there for two years. I've pastored two other churches before. Um, and what I wholeheartedly believe in, historically, you can find the truth in, is the power of the church to change uh, a community, to change a nation. Without uh, the church, whether it was the black church or, or, or the, and I even scarce to say black church, right? But we understand that that was the driver of the civil rights movement. Uh, mm -hmm. And then later uh, we became a, a little more of the universal church and, and other people came in, uh, people of different faiths even uh, mm -hmm. to walk together with us. But, but we have to be more holistic. That's first and foremost. Uh, Dad used to say something to me, uh, don't be so uh, heavenly minded, you're, you're no earthly good, right? Um, we quote in the church a lot, we're in the world, but not right. of the world. But you miss the point, you still are in the world. For the time being, you're in the world, you're here. And if we are here, uh, then we ought to have impact. And that only happens if the church is holistic. It's not just pie in the sky. It's not just quoting scripture. It's about living scripture, right? And so we have to begin to help people understand the importance of God beyond the walls of the sanctuary. Notice I didn't say church, beyond the walls of the sanctuary. If we're going to be the church, God must exist outside the walls of the sanctuary. Secondly, I think that churches uh, must have to be unabashed in how they are positioned by God as the conscience of this nation. I want you just for a second to close your eyes and think about if the church had not been in America, what would America be? Wow. Your abolitionist movement is driven by the church. Your civil rights movement is driven by the church. Listen, if the church did not exist in the United States of America, as flawed as it may be, as flawed wow. and westernized as its representation may be, think about how much further America would have gone in her barbarism, uh, in her greed, uh, in her mistreatment of, again, those who were initially deemed as others. Uh, so we have to do that. We have to speak truth to power. Uh, but I think finally, churches have to be better at preparing their congregants um, mm. 
to enter mm. all facets of society and have impact. So I should be as a pastor training up a set of politicians who believe in God. I should be raising up uh, the next set of educators who teach uh, with the love of God in their heart. I should be raising uh, bankers and financial leaders uh, who lead understanding uh, that money answereth all things, but the greed, the greed of money, uh, that is in fact uh, a wicked thing. And so once we begin to do that, we prepare an army so that we can truly, like Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When the church truly infiltrates every spot in the earth, then many of the problems that exist today uh, should not be as much of a problem. Wow. Wow. That is, that is profound. It, it, it's simple, but it's profound because of the depths of it. If the church, in fact, is that backbone and the heart of our very society, how much different would it be to live here in the United States of America? Um, and that brings me to another thought that um, I wanted you to address as far as advice that you would give to someone who is thinking about um, issues like these, really, really tough topics, or even just sharing their story and, and experiences. In writing Trial by Fire, you've learned a lot of things about yourself, about you know, getting the word out, about sharing ideas. What would you suggest to other people who may want to write about these types of topics uh, and, and events? You know, I, I think it's a, a truly special thing. Um, I've been writing for a while, right? Uh, not, not as a so-called professional writer, but, but God blessed me long time ago uh, to have this love for writing, Mac, for writing. As we've moved into this uh, postmodern technological 24th, 21st century age uh, that is digitized, I still love writing and still believe uh, that in the eons to come, uh, just like we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, there will still be writing uh, that is influencing men and, and women. There's something about writing uh, that I believe transcends time uh, and is able to fuel the ideas of men and able to revolutionize the world. And so what I say to people, anybody, is uh, trust your voice, first and foremost. I do believe it's God-given. I, I do. I happen to believe that. And, and if you're given something to say, uh, realize that if you don't say it, it doesn't get said. Many times we're sitting back waiting, thinking that every, this makes sense. Uh, everybody's thinking this. This is a no-brainer. Uh, but sometimes it takes someone to say it. It takes uh, someone to be able to read it because you said it. That, that becomes the catalyst uh, that becomes the, the, the beginning of that rolling snowball that is able to pick up both momentum and size. So trust your voice. Uh, whatever it is that has been placed in your heart, make sure you get it out. Because once we're done with this, this particular life, we don't have it in this way anymore. Uh, when I started writing, the, the pressing um, sentiment for me was, if you don't say it, you take it to the graveyard. And, and I, don't, I just didn't want to do that. Uh, one person can read what you write and they can turn around and change millions. And so we, we never know, right? And so you, you got to get it out there. If it stays inside of you, it doesn't have impact. But if you use your voice and it gets out there, uh, what, what did Paul say as a preacher? He said, some people plan, some people water, God gets the increase. My job isn't to worry about how many readers I have. Now, mind you, I would love to be a New York Times bestseller. I can't wait to get this in a lot of people's hands. I would love to go all over uh, the country to, to, to places and speak on this, but that's not my, my bag. That's not my job. God gave me something and I just need to go ahead and get it out and leave the results uh, to the God that inspired me to do that. And I would say that to anybody. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I thought about so much. Every time you speak, I have so many different thoughts going through my mind and different scriptures that are coming up. 
um, that I want to address, but we we don't have a whole lot of time. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just want to stay and continue to, to talk and, and just let you speak and, and get some of the, the ideas and thoughts out that you have that are just so profound. Um, but I do want you to, to finish up with any last thoughts that you have in reference to, you know, what you uh, purposed your book to be about uh, and what you want it to do for the people that that have the opportunity to read it. And then any last words that, that you would leave with, with our audience tonight. Okay. I would hope that it spurs a sense of uh, interconnectedness and, and responsibility. I think that uh, the issue that, that relates to race in this country, and some people would say, why, why do we keep talking about that? We keep talking about that because it is one of the core values of our nation. We can try to dismiss it, and, and that truly would be disingenuous of us to do that. Uh, we have to begin to take it and understand that it is an issue that should matter for everyone. It has to matter for everyone because there is a common triumph or a common failure uh, that we are going to experience as Americans. We have vaunted ourselves as one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And, and we have to understand, uh, what does the Bible say? God is not mocked for whatsoever a man sows, so, so shall they reap. And so uh, if we want to keep circling around the mountain, let's, let's keep ignoring it. And one day watch it implode in such a way that, that we can no longer repair it. Mm. Or we can begin to deal now and do the necessary work for radical transformation. And this is the part that no one wants to hear. Martin King spoke of this uh, some time ago in 68-ish before he passed, that for America to be changed, America must change. That sitting uh, in a restaurant did, didn't cost America a whole lot. As a matter of fact, it helped America's economy. Uh, and destroy the black community as a byproduct, but that's another discussion for another oh day. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> What's gonna cost America is this radical transformation uh, in this social structure and systematic structure that has quietly and loudly uh, supported ideals of supremacy and dominance. And, and that means someone's going to have to give up some stuff Ideals. because they never should have had so much stuff to begin with. And that doesn't sit well with people. But I'll leave everyone with this. Uh, I was riding in the car and, and listening to scripture the other day. And um, this was part of the reason that uh, I went to write it in the first place. Nestled in Genesis. Uh, you're going to find somewhere around verse 15-ish or somewhere, Abram, who is Abraham. Now, all three mono, monotheistic faiths know him as a father of the faith, has a bad dream. And God says to him somewhere in there uh, that your people will be taken away into a foreign land. And they will be oppressed for 400 years. He says, but I will punish that nation that mistreats them. And they will leave uh, more wealthy than, than, than going in. Now, uh, many people understand that to mean uh, many different things, right? That already happened in 1948. Maybe it did. Uh, that already happened. But, but then they don't necessarily understand the very timeless nature of God's word. I do not believe that it is possible to viciously and purposely mistreat a group of people. Listen, Pro is real. Uh, the CIA's attack on black communities was real. Uh, the, the infiltration of the Black Panther and other power structures was real. Uh, the, the targeting of young black men is real. Uh, the, the prison pipeline is real. You cannot continually, viciously destroy the lives of people. Uh, and not have to answer for that. And, and to those who say that I'm not a part of the problem, if you're not a part of the solution, you are in fact part of the problem. Mm -hmm. There must be a reckoning one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. As a teacher, I know this. Mm -hmm. Either I pour everything I can into kids to help educate them, 
or because I didn't spend enough time with them on the front end, I'll see them on the back end, maybe as a victim of violence. America has a choice to make. We can make people whole and do the right thing. We can understand, hey, if you can give reparations uh, to, to slave owners uh, at the conclusion of the Civil War, if you can give reparations to, to, to Asian Americans justly deserved uh, under the Reagan administration, if you can give uh, reparations, though little, <laughs> to the indigenous people of the United States of America, surely, surely, you can do much more uh, for the descendants uh, of those who have been enslaved and after enslaved, victim of Jim Crow, and after that, uh, victim of uh, any and every manner of residue of discrimination and racism that we see even today. Amen. Well, I tell you, this has been uh, enlightening. Um, it has caused me to think a, a lot. Hopefully those people who are viewing um, either live or the replay will be able to glean um, what you purposed um, from your book and, and from what you spoke about tonight and move forward in, in a, an empowered way. Um, from this entire conversation. Um, are there any questions? Um, let me just check the comments before okay. I let you go, um, Dr. Desire. So I do have some people on live with us. Thank you all so much for joining us live. We appreciate it. How's everybody doing? Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> they could be anywhere, but they are here with us tonight, Dr. Desire. All righty. So I have, um, I see Jennifer, um, you are on. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, Mrs. Mrs. Jennifer, um, definitely on. You are a Proverbs 31 woman. Thank you Amen. so, so much. Amen. Um, Amen. Yes, yes, yes. Um, we have um, Dr. Lana is joining us this evening. She says, hello. Um, she's thanking you, um, Dr. Yaziah. She also says, so excited to be here. Um, we have Daquan who's given um, stars. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, so we, we have some people joining us. Anyone who has questions, leave the questions here in the comments. Um, myself and, and Dr. Uzziah, when he has time, um, he'll come back and definitely um, greet you and address your questions and, re and reply to them. Um, and, and those last words that you gave with a reckoning, that struck a chord with me because that applies to every area of existence. Um, there is a cause and an effect. So there has to be a reckoning of some sort. So if we can all get involved and purpose to um, behave righteously and do what God has called us to do um, and, and make a positive impact on our communities, I believe the message that you purposed in Trial by Fire um, will make a great impact and be a catalyst for, for change in people's lives, their families, and their communities. So I thank you for your time. Um, where can we find your book? Let's um, make sure we put that out there um, <laughs> and in the comments as well. I'll see if I can get the link from Amazon while you're speaking. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you can find it, amazon.com, absolutely. Uh, that is the, the primary place. Um, go check it out, go check it out. There, there are a couple of other titles there as well now, now that we think about it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you, can, you can also find me at www. D-R-U-A-H, so Dr. U-A-H, Uzziah Anthony Harris, www.druah.org. Uh, you will find a number of links associated uh, with some of the things I do in terms of speaking and preaching, uh, as well as ways to reach out to me um, and get to you. I do book fairs, um, I do church uh, conferences, I do anything simply because I believe we are in a time and season uh, that we have to stand up and be counted, right? Stand up and be counted. So um, I can be reached on Instagram, uh, Dr. Uh, Z I A H, Dr. U Z Z I A H. And uh, you will find me generally on all platforms that way. Uh, Twitter is the same way. Um, LinkedIn is the same way. Facebook, Uzziah Anthony Harris, just as simple as it can be, just my name. Um, and so I look forward to hearing from you. Um, you can find me, uh, my personal business page, Faith Matters uh, on Facebook, Faith Matters, uh, because it does, uh, or at least it should, right? 
If man has faith the size of a mustard seed, they can say to the mountain, you don't have to put your hands on it, be thou removed and it will be cast. And it's time for us to walk in faith and begin to move some of the mountains and other impediments that have kept us from being able to travel along the way. Thank you so much for your time, for your energy, and, and just the wealth of knowledge that you are um, in our community. Um, we are proud, proud to call you pastor, doctor, brother, oh, <laughs> and, and we look forward to your, your future successes. There are many to come. God has um, not only a plan for you, but a purpose, prosperity, and we just um, bless you and bless your wife uh, and your family. Um, so thank you again for your time. Um, good night, everyone. We're going to let Dr. Uzziah go as far as the live stream is concerned. Um, and we will, um, we have to have him on again. So um, I don't know when that will be, but we, <laughs> we're going to talk about that and see if we can't get him back here. So good night, everyone. God bless you. And remember to rise and shine. Amen.